Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to Meet the Professor. It's a day we talk about the management of gastroesophageal cancers in the first of three webinars in this series. We have a great faculty today. Uh, Dr. Van Kutzum and Dr. Klempner will be uh, doing the other two programs, and the other investigators participate in a survey. We're going to show the, the usual treatment practices. As always, if you have any questions or cases you'd like to run by us, just type them into the chat room. We'll talk about as many of these as we have time. We put a one-minute pre- and post-meeting survey on the chat room. If you take that, you'll get a lot more out of this uh, webinar, and we'll learn a little bit about you. We do webinars all the time. Next Tuesday, we're going to do one on non-melanoma skin cancer. Haven't done that for a while. Looking forward to seeing what's new, particularly with uh, checkpoint inhibitors there. And then the first two Saturdays uh, in October are going to be a lot of fun. We're doing day-long meetings, one with the Florida Cancer Specialist in Orlando on October the 7th, covering multiple tumor types. But if you're in the Orlando area, come on by. If not, check it out online. And uh, you can see we're covering gastroesophageal cancers as well with Dr. Saab and uh, Philip. Uh, and then the following Saturday, we'll be out in Las Vegas with the American Oncology Network uh, doing the second part of another day-long program covering some other tumor types. And we again, we if you're in the Vegas area, come on by. And then uh, our first really announcement, uh, we're partnering with the Florida Cancer Specialist to bring back our weekend general medical oncology symposium. Last time we did it was about three weeks before the pandemic started in uh, 2020, so we're really excited to go back to the Turnberry and spend the weekend talking about oncology. we got a lot of great uh, plans and really looking forward to having the Florida Cancer Specialist join us as well as you. Uh, we know that a lot of people end up listening to our work, uh, and uh, if you're into podcasts, check out our Oncology Today series including a recent program we did on pancreatic cancer with Drs. O'Reilly and Weinberg. But today we're here to talk about gastroesophageal cancers, and I'm really glad that we have three webinars, because I think it's going to take three to get through all the stuff we really want to try to talk about, and also to talk about taking care of patients. As always, keep in mind that we're going to talk about uh, some therapies outside of FDA indications, some that are not even approved. We're really going to try to focus on clinical risk benefits tonight. And as we do in all of these programs, we have a bunch of docs who will be presenting a cases from their practice for Dr. Enziger to react to. Here's where we're heading. We're going to talk about a couple of papers uh, that uh, Peter did. And then uh, we're going to try to focus on some of the new developments in the field. Uh, so we're going to start out talking about HER2-positive disease, immunotherapy next, and then uh, novel approaches, particularly Zolbituximab which I'm really curious to hear about in terms of where that's heading in practice. And then we'll finish out if we have time with some more papers from Dr. Enziger. But before we start getting into all this, I thought we could just take a breath and take a look at a couple of papers uh, that uh, Peter was involved with. And, you know, I've always loved the work that Jeff Myhart does done on lifestyle, Peter, a lot in colon cancer, but I think in GI cancers, et, et, et cetera, looking at diet, uh, exercise, and I'm fascinated that you're actually looking at a, a, an actual randomized study now. This was, this was a pilot study, just to see if it's feasible, looking at exercise in the adjuvant setting. Can you kind of briefly, you know, such an interesting and unique uh, angle that you all have there. Can you talk a little bit about the work that you've done, uh, what some of the pathways are, and where you see this heading? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so Jeff, of course, is is a, the world expert in in adjuvant uh, uh, strategies for colorectal cancer, looking at diet and exercise and all of these uh, different uh, ways in which we can reduce the recurrence for colorectal cancer. One of the uh, most important uh, uh, interventions that he's found is exercise, and typically aerobic exercise. Uh, the more you do, the better you do. And, and basically, he's looked at retrospective cohorts uh, showing uh, this benefit uh, in, in a number of studies that he's published. So right now, uh, the problem has been uh, to a certain degree that they've been retrospective studies, and it's often difficult to sort of standardize the exercise regimen. Uh, and uh, what we did in this particular study was basically a feasibility study to see if we could uh, give patients uh, high-end exercise equipment uh, 
uh, and have them use it and basically make sure that they're using it properly and that they're getting the appropriate METs, uh, the appropriate amount of exercise uh, that we can measure and, and show uh, that these patients are actually doing what we're hoping them to do. So the randomized study ultimately will look at patients who receive uh, a projure uh, and are encouraged to exercise versus an intensive exercise uh, regimen uh, where patients are carefully instructed on, uh, on spa level or, or fitness uh, level uh, type equipment uh, to really sort of enforce and to enhance the effectiveness of this intervention. So this study that you see right here is basically was just showing that this is quite doable and um, I think is moving forward. So you uh, were saying something before we got started that I hadn't had, maybe I'm the last person to hear, but I thought it was absolutely fascinating that insulin suppresses the immune system and that, for example, well, diabetics insulin, yeah. have a higher rate of uh, recurrence and have diabetics have a higher rate of recurrence in primaries? Well, I, mean, I think there are a couple of interesting things. One is that, uh, that diabetics have a higher risk of colorectal cancer and colorectal cancer recurrence. Um, and also uh, that, uh, and, and one, uh, it's thought to be a mechanism through insulin uh, and that uh, exposure to simple carbohydrates uh, and or not being able to control your sugar levels leads to uh, this uh, abnormal spikes in insulin, which can affect the immune system. Uh, so uh, Jeff in a number of papers has quite nicely shown that insulin certainly plays a role in that uh, for this reason, diabetics uh, have an increased risk for cancer recurrence. Uh, similarly, you know, with vitamin D3, uh, the initial data showed that patients, particularly in the northern climates, had higher risks of recurrences in the wintertime, uh, and that this ultimately uh, was thought to be related to sunlight exposure. Uh, and uh, data from Ava Schoenheimer, for instance, showed that a light exposure would also impact this. So uh, that's why we're recommending vitamin D3 for patients as well. So I think Again, I think there's a number of non-pharmacological uh, interventions that can be made, and uh, this certainly, I think, uh, uh, is important. Exercise affects insulin, uh, and patients uh, with, uh, with good uh, exercise habits uh, have better control of insulin levels and, uh, and also can improve their immune system. I was curious, too, because I know this pilot study, uh, you had patients with gastroesophageal cancer. I'm just kind of curious how people feel when you, you know, sort of prescribe exercise. Uh, does it, and I think it's been thought that maybe it could improve cancer induced fatigue. Uh, it seems like having just finished chemotherapy is not maybe a tough time to start thinking about getting some exercise equipment in your house and working out. But how do the patients react to it? Well, it, it, it's quite variable. Uh, you know, you'll often get the spouse sort of uh, giving the, the other spouse the sort of the elbow and saying, ah, you know, I told you you should be exercising uh, to patients who are really into it uh, and say, I've been exercising and, and I can certainly do this. I think it's one of the hardest interventions um, of all the many different things that we tell patients to do to try to reduce their risk for recurrence. Exercise is one of the most difficult things for people to, to do, particularly if they've not been in the habit of doing it. Uh, but I think that uh, a, particularly in colorectal cancer, uh, where we see the patients once every three months, you can continuously reinforce this and keep on asking, are you exercising? Are you not? In esophagogastric cancer, you know, the, the benefit, there's no tumor marker to follow. Uh, we don't get the scans as frequently. So there's less of a chance to reinforce this uh, with those patients. But I'm convinced that, uh, that exercise should work across the board for any malignancy uh, and would be beneficial for anybody who's completed adjuvant therapy. So the other uh, paper, we have a bunch of other papers I'm not sure we're going to get to, but I really wanted to ask you about this that you're going to be presented at the ESMO meeting is coming up, I guess, so soon. Uh, you know, always interested in tumor agnostic, a, a baseline informed uh, MRD assays. This, I guess, is not Signatera, but this is a fascinating study that, again, we were chatting about before we get started. Can you give us a little preview? I know it's part of a larger project looking at yeah. the MRD, but what you saw, what you're looking at right here. <laughs> 
Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, this study um, looks at a, uh, the study that, that this belongs to looks at a number of different uh, concepts and ideas. It basically was a study that looked at chemotherapy plus trastuzumab and, and bevacizumab. Uh, and the idea was that um, we could not only uh, predict response to anti-HER2-based therapy very quickly, and in fact, before the patients got chemotherapy and trastuzumab and bevacizumab, they got a week of trastuzumab monotherapy, and we checked blood at baseline and then one week into the treatment. And we were able to find that patients who had a significant drop uh, in circulating a tumor DNA in response just to trastuzumab had dramatically improved uh, a duration of response, progression-free survival, and overall survival to the point that uh, these patients probably could have done quite well without chemotherapy. They probably could have had a non-chemotherapy approach. The other thing that we demonstrated in this study, and, and uh, that's part of this, is that basically what we're seeing is that the um, uh, genetics of resistance are present early on in these cancer patients at very low levels. And what we're seeing is an extinction of this mutational signature as the patient responds to the treatment. And then these mechanisms of resistance uh, sort of rebound uh, and, uh, and proceed by two or three months uh, any sort of progression of disease that we see. So the important point to make is that um, resistance doesn't develop during treatment. We're not creating resistant clones, but these mechanisms of resistance, these mutations are present at low levels in subclonal sites early on and are extinguished and then recur uh, as, we, as patients ultimately progress. Yeah, that's really amazing. And you know, trastuzumab alone, it actually, you know, all the new things that have come out, HER2 positive antibody drug conjugates, pertuzumab, et cetera, there was actually a neoadjuvant trial of trastuzumab alone in breast cancer before all that started. I think they had like a 25, 30% response rate. Of course, then it got much more complicated, but you forget that it can have a, an effect in and of itself. And speaking of that, let's move on and talk about HER2-positive gastroesophageal cancer. Uh, I think this first case is a great example of how, you know, we've been doing the, the, these uh, videos with docs in practice, particularly general medical oncologists. Uh, Dr. Lee actually presented our lead case in the mantle cell webinar we did two days ago. It's incredible. These general medical oncologists keep up to date on everything. But I think also I, I feel like a lot of times in just a minute of a video, you get a, a real picture of the feeling and the human side of it. And I think that's very clear in this case. So I will, first of all, I'm going to we'll start out with the beginning of this uh, case, a uh, 64 year old man. Uh, we're going to stop and uh, see how, how you would uh, think through treatment. And then we're going to come back and see what happened. Here's Dr. Lee. 64 year old man from Vietnam established his care for metastatic squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus. Interestingly enough, this was a gentleman that his children consulted me. He was still in Vietnam. In Vietnam, he was treated with capecitabine, oxycletin, and docetaxel for four cycles. He did get PET scans over there, and it did show a partial response. He traveled over to see me for a second opinion, and I did get a biopsy and ran an NGS on him, and he showed a HER2 ERBB2 overexpression, pdl one CPS of 10%. So I opted to treat the patient with 5F uses plan and trastuzumab. Now, this was some years ago. So my question is, is this what the investigators would use today? Would you add pembrolizumab to a HER2 targeted regimen for upper GI cancers? What actually happened? He eventually progressed with worsening left neck adenopathy. I switched him over to single agent nivolumab. He progressed from that and ended up with brain metastases. So uh, first, before we get into what you would do at this point, um, saw this uh, press release uh, that came out a, a couple months ago about the Keynote 811 trial. And of course, we saw the approval of first-line Pembro in addition to sort of the TOGA approach that we'd had that this patient got with chemo plus trastuzumab. And I was always, I thought it was really interesting in the beginning. It got approved, you know, just based on response rate. It was approved in everybody. 
And if you look at that original uh, thing, I asked Dr. Jen Jijin about this a couple of times, 85% of those patients in that trial were PD-1 positive. So they, they didn't really comment on, I mean, it's so few numbers, you couldn't really say, so everybody was getting it. And it sounds like, although as far as I know, they haven't presented this yet, it sounds like now they have a lot more data. And, you know, like we've seen in other situations, it seems like adding Pembro with PD-1 negative is not going to be helpful even in HER2. Uh, so first, any thoughts about that? Did you, were you, have you been using Pembro? And when you saw this press release, did you stop using it? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I had uh, been using uh, Keynote 811 for all of my patients uh, with uh, HER2 positive disease. Uh, although I was one of the people who was a little worried about the CPS zeros. Um, and uh, in those patients, uh, there were a few patients that I didn't treat with, with pembrolizumab. So I, I see myself a little bit uh, vindicated in, 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 in being more cautious. Uh, but I do think that, uh, again, based on the data now with progression-free survival, uh, it makes sense to add pembrolizumab to anybody who has a CPS of, of one or higher. Uh, obviously, uh, we all want to see uh, the uh, progress, uh, progression-free survival, the overall survival data. Uh, and the fact that it hasn't appeared yet, I think, bodes well uh, for our patients. Um, and number one, I think it, it probably has to do with the fact that we're uh, having difficulty getting the number of deaths that we need to analyze the study. It's always required. Uh, and number two, I think it just speaks to the fact that patients with, again, and, and Elena was very careful in this study of confer centrally confirming HER2 positivity. And I think at one point she told me that uh, one third of the patients that were HER2 positive on the outside centrally were excluded. So these were very carefully selected HER2 positive patients. But I think what it may also suggest is that when you truly have HER2 positive disease, you're going to do quite well, and it's going to take a long time for an overall survival advantage to read out. Uh, and I think, again, what this shows is that this is a different group of patients. And again, what we know for right now is, and I don't know anything more than, than the press release, is that we should be using pembrolizumab for anybody with a CPS score of, of one or higher. What about uh, second-line therapy and these sort of legacy patients, again, like this patient who get who didn't get uh, Pembro first-line but were PD-1 positive? Dr. Lee gave the patient single-agent nivolumab. The patient didn't respond. Is that what you usually do, second-line? No. I mean, I, I typically give paclitaxel and ramaciramab for the, for the adenocarcinoma patients. But this patient has a squamous cell carcinoma where clearly pembrolizumab and nivolumab has a second line indication. And we also are seeing evidence of tizolizumab, spartalizumab, all these other drugs. Clearly, checkpoint inhibitors work better in squamous cell carcinoma than they do in adenocarcinoma. So I do think that in this patient, if they didn't get a checkpoint inhibitor up front, uh, it is appropriate to give it a second line. Unfortunately, we see, or I wouldn't say unfortunately, we give most of our checkpoint inhibitors up front so uh, that uh, this situation where they haven't gotten one up front and where there's an opportunity to give it in second line is relatively rare now. So what about this patient's current situation? And now the patient got progressed the nivolumab, but not only did the patient progress the systemically, but now with a bunch of uh, brain mets, what would you be yeah. thinking to do? Well, we actually uh, have a study that we're hoping to publish relatively soon looking at patients with brain mets. Um, and it's quite clear that HER2 positivity is a significant risk factor for getting brain metastases. In fact, uh, I think in our study, 40% of all the patients who had brain mets from esophagogastric cancer were HER2 positive. Uh, so this is a significant risk factor, um, and uh, and uh, it doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, amongst us, uh, people who, who treat these cancers frequently, we just say it's a matter of time before you develop brain mets. Uh, as if the disease systemically is controlled, eventually uh, patients will end up with brain metastases. So, what the would other you be thinking for treatment wise? Well, what so I think a, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, if you can get it approved, that targets HER2. I mean, ideally, you want to get a biopsy of the brain uh, lesion uh, to make sure that it's still HER2 positive. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, we've seen a concordance in our studies where we've gotten both uh, biopsies of the systemic uh, lesion as well as the brain lesion and have found concordance uh, in pretty much uh, in the majority of patients. The problem is that the antibodies don't cross the blood-brain barrier uh, and that you really need a tyrosine kinase inhibitor uh, such as tocatinib, for instance, uh, would be a good choice for a patient uh, with a brain metastasis. And we'll talk about the fact that, you know, the uh, Mountaineer uh, str uh, strategy of tucatinotrastezumab is being looked at. Uh, and of course, in colon, you know, it's, it works. In, in colon, so, yeah. You know, so, but but in, in esophageal, esophageal, in gastric, the, the study is now on hold. Uh, so that study is not moving forward. So um, for whatever reason, uh, that uh, it, I thought it was a very good study that they had uh, planned to do, but it's not moving forward. Oh, that's um, interesting. I didn't know that. Uh, Neil, before we move on, I just want to point out one very unusual aspect of this case. Uh, you know, almost uh, it's almost unheard of uh, for a squamous cell carcinoma to be HER2 positive. It's almost hmm. uniquely adenocarcinomas. Um, and uh, I've had only one case in my career with a squamous cell carcinoma that's HER2 positive. My pathologists tell me that in the squamous cell carcinoma, it's probably just a bystander variant and that it probably isn't the driver. Uh, so it is important to know that uh, you probably don't even need to test the squamous cell carcinomas for HER2 positivity. Uh, it's really a phenomenon that really only seems to impact treatment in adenocarcinomas. So, And I'm sure Dr. Dr. Lee was surprised when he saw the result. And you know, I was just thinking of the human situation of his children, the patient's children coming to see him. You see the way he comes across as a as a yeah. doctor, bringing their dad all the way over from Vietnam uh, with the hope yep. that he could be treated. And, you know, with metastatic incurable disease, a terrible situation. Oh, there's yeah. A pretty interesting. E there's a pretty interesting ending to this story. Here it is. Yep. At that point. Because he had a HER2 overexpression, I actually was able to get TDXD off label. It's only indicated in like lower GE junction adenocarcinoma, but I was able to get it off label, start him on that. He had a dramatic response to his brain meds. He did not need surgery. He did not require radiation to the brain and he remains under very good control right now. In fact, he's been on TDXD now for well over a year. He did experience progression, not in the brain, but in the shoulder and I think in the lung. There's a solitary new met in the lung and there's a solitary progressing metastasis to the left shoulder that he endorsed. He had pain, so I restaged him. I'm sending him for radiation, for SBRT to those areas to try to kind of spot control it because I feel like I'm getting very good control with the TDXD for his brain meds. He's fully functional. He's, you know, ECOG one independent with everything. And he doesn't want surgery for his brain meds, which are under very good control right now. In fact, I think he has complete resolution of his brain meds on MRI. So there's no real role for radiation for him, but I'm trying to keep the TDXD on for as long as possible because I do think that he did have a benefit from that regarding his brain metastases. Any thoughts about future systemic therapy, particularly the use of tucatinib trastuzumab, the mountaineer approach, and particularly because he has brain mets? Right. And so that's actually my next regimen for him. I would similarly try to find an off-label approach and try to use tucatinib for him if he progresses in regards to his brain metastases, especially in regards to his brain metastases, because I would have to find something that has CNS penetration. Any thoughts about this? You know, we know there are responses to EXD and breast in the brain, but wow, I was stunned when I heard this. Yeah, no, it's obviously a wonderful story and 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 and, a, and an out, outstanding outcome. I mean, I think that uh, this is a highly unusual case. As I said, I've only seen one squamous cell carcinoma that's HER2 positive in, in my life. Uh, and I, again, I think we probably uh, don't know very much about this particular entity. So it's great news that that this can work. Uh, as you pointed out, in breast cancer, you can use TDXD for brain mets. Uh, and 
uh, again, I, I, I have the same concern as he was just pointing out about the penetration across the blood brain barrier where typically TKIs seem to have the advantage. If you've had surgery uh, to the brain, that sort of breaks down this blood brain barrier. And there is some thought that particularly metastases that are close to the dura uh, can uh, respond to the larger molecules. Uh, but uh, again, uh, uh, it's it's uh, these are very unusual circumstances and patients. So uh, it's wonderful to hear an anecdote like that. All right. So obviously TDXD is something we're talking about a lot in general, of course, in breast cancer, but also lung cancer, colon cancer, and a gastroesophageal or gastric cancer. Uh, one of the other docs who was presenting cases. Uh, this is Dr. Strickland. He's actually a GI specialist, uh, but in the practice now. He had a bunch of questions about HER2-positive gastroesophageal cancer and about TDXD. Here they are. Is there a role for anti-HER2 therapy to be integrated into the management of locally advanced gastroesophageal cancer? Because we have some interesting phase two data that exists. Anything you'd like to hear them discuss about their experience with TDXD? Now that trastuzumab directs TCAN is an improved second line therapy and pneumonitis has been a concern in early studies, could you talk about your experience using trastuzumab directs TCAN with respect to pneumonitis as a toxicity or other toxicities that may have arisen? If a patient is demonstrating a favorable response, but unfortunately develops evidence of low grade ILD, can you discuss your management of that toxicity? And then subsequently, if they recover, can you discuss your approach to the question of rechallenging that patient with trastuzumab directs TCAN? So uh, general oncologists are always uh, perplexed why they don't use anti hair therapy in locally advanced because neoadjuvant her anti hair therapy is so standard. Mm. Everybody in breast cancer gets it. But there was this trial that was negative. Everybody comments on. But still, I guess you you don't do it, even though you, and we know, I guess you get a little extra bump of anti-tumor effect. And again, you know, I think that uh, if we have more effective uh, anti-HER2 uh, therapies, uh, this could change. Uh, and just because trastuzumab didn't work doesn't mean that a more effective anti-HER2 um, uh, a treatment couldn't accomplish what trastuzumab couldn't do. But I think uh, for now, uh, we have one study with trastuzumab that's negative, and we have no data with TDXD. So I would not recommend any anti-HER2 therapy uh, for locally advanced disease at, at this time. So what about his question about ILD? You know, it's really interesting when, when I talk to compare what I hear from the breast people, from the lung people, and the GI people. Uh, particularly in terms of this issue. I mean, the breast people are like, if asymptomatic ILD, grade one, they recover, consider rechallenge. But if they have symptoms, the breast people do not retreat. I'm not, the lung, I'm not so sure about, and I'm really curious uh, in uh, upper GI what your thoughts are about his question about these people who have, you know, sometimes it's hard to even figure out are the symptoms from the ILD, particularly in lung where they have so much comorbidities. But what about rechallenge after ILD, Peter? Yeah, I think we've gotten much more sensitive to uh, pneumonitis and symptoms of pneumonitis, patients complaining of shortness of breath. And uh, that's really thanks to uh, uh, immunotherapy where, you know, basically when we started, you had a patient with shortness of breath and you'd say, oh, they're deconditioned or they've got some heart failure and you'd, you'd sort of hold off until until things got worse. And, and I think that's why early on in the use of IO, uh, there were uh, more deaths, uh, particularly with pneumonitis. Now, when we have a patient with shortness of breath, you know, they get the CAT scan right away, and we often uh, will uh, find basically grade one pneumonitis for both IO and, and for, for, uh, for Zolbituximab. I mean, not for Zolbituximab, for, um, uh, for, uh, for TDXD. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, I pretty much follow the, the, the recommendations that you just outlined, 
Uh, I do, if I see pneumonitis on a scan and the patient does have some shortness of breath, uh, I will stop the agent and I will try something else. Uh, and sometimes we give steroids for, for, more, uh, uh, for more advanced uh, ILD. Uh, but if the patient does have grade two ILD, I generally will not re-challenge the patient uh, with, with this agent. But uh, with grade one, I certainly have had uh, a number of, not a number of patients, but uh, two patients where I did re-challenge them uh, and uh, at a lower dose, uh, and uh, there was tolerability, although uh, I th both patients ultimately progressed. Uh, so I think, again, I think we have to be cautious. We have to be vigilant about the shortness of breath, uh, but I wouldn't push it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, uh, if patients are becoming symptomatic and have findings on CT, I, I would discontinue the agent. And for grade one, temporarily and rechallenge later on. For grade two, I, I, I'm reluctant to retry it again. So I'm just going to flip through some of the slides we have in the slide deck. You can check these papers out to learn more of the details, um, as we always do. But, you know, obviously this uh, agent has had very significant efficacy. Uh, we talked about uh, tolerability issues. What about chemotherapy like side effects, GI side effects, alopecia? Again, the breast people talk about that being pretty significant. They premedicate. How about in GE cancer? Yeah, I mean, I've had some patients with nausea um, and fatigue uh, and alopecia, certainly, but it's not really been a major issue. I've not had to discontinue the treatment for any reason other than the, the few patients I've had with ILD. So I think overall, uh, the agent is well tolerated. Um, as you point out, uh, you do have some chemotherapy side effects. After all, the drug is basically uh, uh, a is basically trastuzumab linked to exotecan, which is like irinotecan. So you're going to get some diarrhea-like side effects. Uh, and you know, I think that that generally is is mild. And uh, and we as GI oncologists know very well how to deal with with diarrhea. So uh, I think. Generally speaking, it's been a well-tolerated agent. It's been remarkably effective uh, in uh, a significant proportion of patients uh, and clearly uh, fills an important niche uh, for our patients with uh, trastuzumab refractory disease. So I'm going to take a look at some of the faculty uh, uh, responses to our survey. But first, uh, here's the phase three trial. Interestingly, comparing TDXC to paclitaxel ramucirumab any predictions of what we're going to see efficacy-wise there, Peter? <laughs> I, you're getting, you're going to get me in trouble, Neil. So, I mean, it, it, it's, it, I think that uh, given the given the uh, response rate for PACRAM in second line, which is basically 28% response rate, and a 9.6 month uh, overall survival, if you basically look at the patients that are HER2 positive. Uh, and you look at destiny one and two, you know, you are, you see a higher response rate, uh, in those patients, uh, and you see probably a better, uh, a better, uh, median overall survival. The problem is, is that the patients with HER2 positive disease receiving paclitaxel and ramucirumab also do better. Uh, so I think that it's going to be quite close and I could see, uh, having, uh, some, some mild advantages, uh, but I think it's going to be a close study, to be honest with you. So Abdul in the chat room uh, wants to know about HER2 low, which, of course, everybody brings up. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, but here's people's responses in terms of second-line therapy. So first, uh, after the TOGA approach, as in the case we talked about, and interestingly, people are on to uh, TDXD there in that situation, we also asked about the, you know, the, the keynote 811 strategy, what they do second line, same thing. This is the way we do a consensus conferences, Peter. We ask people what they do, and if they all say the same thing, we call it a consensus. Here's the question we were just talking about in terms of ILD. Most people, this is almost a consensus, but uh, say grade two, the way you were just talking about as a reason to discontinue. Not too much interest in her too low, uh, Abdul. But maybe with, uh, do we have data on that yet, Peter? They did look early on uh, in some phase one and phase two studies at the, at the low data. Uh, it was 
it was unclear if there was there was some hint of 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 activity. Uh, well, I should say there was activity, but uh, I don't. It was not that imp- impressive. I have to be careful because I, this may not be publicly available. So uh, I I should be careful of, of this talking about this. I don't know if this has been published or released. Um, so. Well, in any event, the principles there, and it would be great to see data on this because, I mean, the other thing is how often, you know, breast cancer, HER2 low is very common. How, how often do you see HER2 low in uh, GE cancers? Well, even more so, right? I mean, the problem with really? the beauty of breast cancer is that it's homogenous, right? So if you're HER2 3 plus, every single cancer cell in breast cancer is going to be 3 plus. Uh, I mean, I, there may be cases, a few cases where it's not that, but it's really homogenous. Whereas in, in GI cancers, it is, uh, in gastric in particular, it's completely heterogeneous. You can get areas even in the same biopsy that are HER2 new 3 plus in an area nearby that is 1 plus. Uh, it, and this is the reason why uh, rebiopsying is actually very helpful to s- determine if the recurrence is actually still HER2 positive. About a third of the patients that were HER2 positive at the beginning uh, turn uh, HER2 new negative uh, on progression. Uh, so um, I saw that Sam Klempner had just uh, put in that he both gives paclitaxel and ramucirumab and TDXD. Uh, and, and basically, I'm sure the way he does it is he basically rebiopsies in the HER2 positive ones, he gives TDXD, and the HER2 new negative ones, he gives paclitaxel and ramucirumab. The interesting point is that if you give paclitaxel and ramucirumab, you then often will see a re-energizing HER2 positive clone in third line, and that if you then rebiopsy them again, uh, there are many patients that bec- become HER2 positive once again. So uh, it is uh, it it makes treatment quite difficult, and there can be sites that uh, uh, metastases that are HER2 positive, and then other metastases that are HER2 new negative. So, yeah, I'm thinking all the discussions we had with your breast cancer colleagues, you know, Dr. Tulaney, Dr. Burstein, et cetera, et cetera, about that. And it's very interesting that you guys, the GI, GI investigators, they rebiopsy, they follow the rebiopsy. In breast, once they're positive, they're positive. Because they so, don't need I mean, to. Different... They don't need to. What? They don't need to. It, it, it's Once it's HER2 positive in breast, it's always HER2 positive. So they, well, just... they have an easy job. Well, just pointing out that the uh, difference there, I mean, I think in breast, uh, HER2 negative has become a, a disappearing breed. Everybody's just finding, trying to find a little bit of HER2 so they can give TDXD. All right, let's talk a little bit about immunotherapy. Uh, I think that this story is one of the more complicated immunotherapy uh, is, uh, stories that we deal with in solid tumors. And uh, hopefully every time we talk about this, I feel like I learn a little bit more about some of the subtleties of it. But let's uh, go back to clinical practice and Dr. Uh, Dallas, who has a 53-year-old man, uh, and uh, here's the case. This gentleman had initially presented to his primary physician with a globus sensation and dysphagia, EGD, partially obstructive mass in the mid to distal esophagus. He did have an adjacent small lymph node on CT and an enlarged superior mediastinal lymph node, which on PET scan did turn out to be FTG AVID. We decided to proceed with definitive carboplatin and paclitaxel with the weekly regimen concurrent with radiation as in the cross trial, and then definitive radiation to that non-regional node. So my question for this case is there have been some reports of patients having non-regional lymphadenopathy resected. I'm not sure that there's significant benefit for that. But if he's had a good response in this lymph node, would it make sense for him to proceed to surgical resection? So uh, Kamal in the chat room says, I just saw yesterday a patient who lost her too and repeat biopsy and breast cancer. So it's rare, but it does happen. And Hassan says for GEJ adenocarcinoma to use chemo radiation a la cross or perioperative flight. Dr. Dallas has a question, as you heard, about the uh, adenopathy and also the issue of, of course, uh, post, uh, post-op uh, nivolumab. So any thoughts about the, all these issues? Sure, I can address a few of them. So uh, the uh, 
the question of cross versus uh, flot uh, is is an important one. And uh, one is a chemoradiation approach, and one is a, is a perioperative chemotherapy approach. There is a study called ESOPEC uh, that basically looked at patients receiving flot for the most part. I think three quarters of the patients in the trial received flot, and then uh, about a, a quarter of them received magic. And then the other group received cross. And basically, it was a wash. The outcome was the same. It should be pointed out, though, that this was in the pre nivolumab era. Uh, so none of these patients got a checkpoint inhibitor on the cross regimen. So there is another study that um, is... Um, uh, that is looking at the same question with flot versus cross, uh, and we'll see where they come in. Uh, but I think the question is is more complicated now that we have two studies, uh, both Attraction 5 and the Keynote uh, 595 study, that have not shown a benefit for perioperative immunotherapy, uh, and another study with uh, the Matterhorn study suggesting a response benefit uh, for perioperative chemotherapy. And then we have the cro uh, we have uh, Checkmate um, 577 showing a benefit for nivolumab. So uh, I wonder if immunotherapy is going to cha change the balance between chemoradiation therapy and perioperative chemotherapy for the GE junction. I think as far as pure gastric is concerned, we've shown over and over again that radiation therapy is not of additional benefit. So the question really is, esophageal adenocarcinoma and GE junction adenocarcinoma, should we be treating with perioperative chemotherapy or should we be giving chemo rads with immunotherapy? And I think that question is, is still to be decided. Um, so, what was the other question? Oh, this patient with a non-regional lymph node. You know, I think that right. we all have cases like this and you know, this is why we have tumor boards, and we have a tumor board as well where we basically talk about patients that don't conform to, to the standard guidelines. We often will punt on these patients with non-regional disease and say, well, why don't we give them chemotherapy first and see if they have a chemotherapy responsive cancer? Uh, and then uh, we typically will treat non-regional lymphadenopathy with, with radiation therapy or chemoradiation therapy rather than resection. And we typically try to do definitive chemo rads for oligometastatic disease in this setting. Uh, surgery continues to be very morbid and has a, a significant mortality rate at many centers. Uh, so I think we try to avoid surgery, except in patients where we're fairly certain that they have a curative intent uh, option. So I always love it when what appears to be an ongoing case pops up in the chat room that I think you might be able to really help with. And I think I see that here from Emily, 67-year-old woman, newly diagnosed distal GE adenocarcinoma, deemed resectable by the surgeon, locally advanced. MMR deficient, mm. HER2 negative, HER2 negative. Cross, what about neoadjuvant immunotherapy? Yeah, uh, that's an, that is uh, a very interesting uh, uh, chapter now. Um, as we're all aware of, uh, the, uh, of the data in rectal cancer, where uh, we've seen amazing responses uh, to neoadjuvant immunotherapy and, and basically not needing to go to surgery. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, other uh, uh, GI oncologists are looking at, at other GI cancers to see if this uh, is could potentially be of benefit as well. A study called uh, uh, GERCOR NEONIPIGA, uh, that's a mouthful, uh, a European study, uh, which you have right here, wonderful, um, uh, basically uh, sh uh, looked at a uh, 32 patients uh, and gave them uh, nivolumab, six cycles, and two cycles of ipilimumab. Uh, and basically what they found was that in these MMR-deficient patients, uh, a pathologic, and these all patients were all scheduled to undergo surgery. And in fact, most all of them underwent surgery except for a couple of patients who refused or had some complications. But among the patients who underwent surgery, 59% had a path CR. Uh, 
Um, and, you know, I think that the question in the future will be, do they need to undergo surgery? Uh, and in the short term, uh, we're beginning to use these therapies preferentially uh, a, instead of giving chemo radiation therapy, which has long-term consequences, is significantly more morbid. Uh, so I've had now a number of patients, a uh, uh, half a dozen patients with MMR deficient esophageal and GE junction cancer, who I've now treated with immunotherapy up front, and it's worked remarkably well. Um, and some of them have gone on to surgery and some haven't. Um, and uh, again, uh, we're seeing some very good early data uh, in this group of patients. You'd say, well, Dr. Enzinger, you know, you, you should be only doing things if you have a randomized phase three study, level one evidence. The problem is that this is such a rare entity, you're never going to get enough patients uh, to do uh, a large randomized phase three study. So I think we're going to be stuck uh, uh, for a long time, basically, using our best judgment uh, for these rare groups of patients. So I see another great case, uh, seems a little bit similar, but one major difference in there from Susanna, who has a 47-year-old woman with CDH1 somatic mutation, gastric metastatic gastroadenocarcinoma germline negative. I, it looks a little complicated to get into, but what I, what I was curious about is, I think I've heard that like somatic MSI responds better than germline. And that like most or all the patients in the memorial series are somatic. Is that true? Or was I dreaming that? Well, there's two different things, right? The CDH1 is again, if you're, if you're germline, this is hereditary gastric cancer and somatic. We see CDH1. Uh, it, it can uh, affect prognosis, but we don't specifically treat for that. As far as germline versus, uh, a, a, as far as germline versus, uh, somatic uh, mutations. Yes, I've seen that data as well. But honestly, uh, if I have an MMR deficient tumor, regardless of the source, I've been uh, giving them immunotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting. And for metastatic disease, I also give them immunotherapy if they've got a high disease burden or um, or they're symptomatic, I will add chemotherapy to the immunotherapy. Uh, but really, I think for these rare patients, uh, immunotherapy has really revolutionized the care in this area of GI, just as it has in, in other uh, cancers. So let's get into another case. We're well, flipping from a 50-year-old to 83-year-old patient of uh, Dr. Rudolph. Also, Dr. Chotsky at the end had some re related comments. Here's the case. Sure enough, on scope, she had a small ulceration at the GE junction. It was tiny and was positive for adenocarcinoma. So after recovery from her cardiac status, she came back to me. She was initially ambulatory, but upon her return, came to me in a wheelchair with her family members. And oddly enough, they all were very interested in wanting to pursue treatment of her esophageal cancer. So she is bordering on ECOG too. But given her limited disease, I would love to know what is the optimal regimen? Would somebody put her through the cross regimen with chemo radiation therapy? I don't think she would pass surgery. Lastly, with the carboplatin shortage and the ASCO guidelines, talk about considering 5 of oxaliplatin or full FOX. I would love to know more details about the exact dosing, frequency, et cetera, of 5 of oxali or full FOX in combination with radiation therapy. I'm just kind of curious. Do you have a shortage of chemotherapy and carboplatin now? Yes. Oh, this is the biggest challenge for all of us. Yes. So carboplatin and cisplatin. More than a month ago, we were restricted not to do it for any metastatic palliative patient. It was only approved for the curative intent. And every day we sat down with the charge nurses and decided that which patient can get it and which patient cannot. It actually has improved. A lot. I was able to give it to my patients even for the palliative intent recently. So actually, I forgot to put in a little detail about Dr. Rudolph's case. The patient was an older woman presented with uh, some GI symptoms. 
she sent the patient for a scope and the patient had a cardiac arrest at, right after they did the biopsy, recovered completely. But I should have put that little comment in there before you. So before you think about how to treat just an 83 year old, keep in mind that she just had a cardiac arrest. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. She's in the, the docs in the chat room. She's 86 year old. I was maybe a typo. So 86. Anyhow, uh, we'll get to chemo shortage in a second. But first, what about the case? You know, again, status post uh, cardiac arrest has localized disease, really not a candidate uh, for surgery. Yeah. But I don't know, would she be a candidate for cross or what would you do? I think one would be very careful uh, in an 86 year old in particular. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that, well, as you know, uh, surgery is contraindicated within six months or major surgery is contraindicated within six months of a heart attack. Uh, I don't know if if that was part of of this cardiac arrest or if this was just a, a malignant um, rhythm, um, but uh, I, I think that uh, one would be very careful. Um, the I would want to know exactly what stage of cancer this is. Uh, you know, with an ulceration, you can sometimes still have a T1A tumor. Um, and I would get an EUS and see if if it's an early stage cancer. If it's a small ulcer, um, one could potentially do an ESD. Uh, although I'm sure that the uh, the gastroenterologist isn't going to be that eager to do a procedure on this lady either. So, if you would do a non invasive treatment, uh, you know, carbotaxel radiation therapy, I think would be. I've treated healthy 86 year olds and and even older 80 uh, patients in their 80s, but somebody with a recent cardiac event, I think it would depend on exactly what that cardiac event was but I would be very cautious. I mean, you could certainly shorten this patient's life rather than prolonging it. Um, and perhaps some mild treatment uh, would be in order for a patient like this uh, without any radiation, uh, at only when they start becoming symptomatic. So uh, again, uh, I would probably want to know, you know, is there persistent heart failure? Was there a myocardial infarction as part of this arrest? Uh, I would probably need to know more details uh, before uh, risking any of these procedures. Um, but I would just say in general, an 86-year-old, we typically, uh, who is not a surgical candidate, other than this particular case, uh, we do give cross. Uh, it's very nice because you give weekly treatments and you can adjust. Uh, whereas with Fulfox, uh, you give a big slug every two weeks, uh, or with the old cisplatin 5-FU data, uh, you give a big slug and you can't really adjust. Whereas with weekly treatment, you can really adjust uh, for for uh, an elderly patient in particular. Um, and uh, as, uh, the carboplatin uh, shortage, uh, at least at our institute, is, is over. So we haven't had any problems in the last few months. Uh, so uh, again, I think... I would consider that in a, in a healthy 86 year old, but probably I would be very concerned in this individual. So actually, Dr. Like I said, Dr. Rudolph's in the chat room and she says, uh, could not get EUS. They were very nervous. She's now, yeah. she's, now it's five weeks later. I talked to her five weeks ago. Now she's, it's five weeks later. She's getting RT and, uh, she, I think, yeah, she's getting low dose carbotaxel as well. She's five weeks in no hospitalizations. Doing Good. well, fingers crossed. Yeah, uh, yeah I so, think that you know, radiation we, alone. I, I, sorry to to talk over you, but I think radiation therapy alone is is actually an option for patients of the lower performance status uh, and can offer some palliation. So uh, we have in the chat room a number of the the papers that we've talked about many times, and we'll talk about them in the other meetings as well on Nevo and now a uh, Pembro. But I was really curious about this other uh, uh, agent, tizolizumab, where we have data. But one of the things I, I have, up to now, I've kind of view all the PD-1 agents as the same, but this one's a little bit different in terms of how it works. So can you kind of explain that? I guess it's related to the FC uh, portion. Right. They actually have a, a large cohort of different trials where they're basically getting indications in many different cancers, primarily for the Chinese market. But tizolizumab uh, basically is marketed or co-marketed with Novartis, who has the U.S. and, and European rights. The idea behind this particular agent is that it's FC optimized. 
And there's some theory that uh, by manipulating the immune system and I think suppressing the macrophages uh, or uh, or manipulating the macrophages uh, that you're going to get an enhanced uh, uh, effect on the tumor cell. Um, they've had difficulty, I think, so far showing any dramatic changes. They've had some interesting preclinical data and some phase two data suggesting some benefit. Uh, but ultimately, this agent has shown uh, once again that uh, checkpoint inhib inhibitors work remarkably well in squamous cell carcinoma, uh, where uh, this uh, a drug, both Rational uh, 305 and 306, shows frontline efficacy and second-line efficacy for this agent uh, in second-line monotherapy and frontline in combination. Uh, interestingly, with taxane platinum therapy, which is favored in China, um, and, uh, and also a, a benefit in adenocarcinoma, although it has a really unusual overall survival curve where there's really no difference between the two curves up front and then the curves separate. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, I think that, uh, again, I think uh, in adenocarcinoma, the benefit for these PD-1 inhibitors is more borderline uh, than it is in squamous cell where these drugs are clearly very effective. So I want to get your take on zolbituximab. I get a lot of questions about that. But first, uh, we also are getting questions. And it sort of it seems like the age-old question of uh, a PD-1 level and whether to use nivolumab uh, uh, or a checkpoint in the adjuvant uh, in the metastatic uh, uh, situation. In the adjuvant situation, uh, it's interesting uh, that people have variable responses. You're, I guess, you're the only one who kind of looks at PD-1 level. Um, but and here's a, a look at neoadjuvant a checkpoint that we were just uh, talking about. So the metastatic, we get a lot of questions about this, and here you see uh, metastatic disease uh, and whether or not uh, people use add-on an IO uh, to chemotherapy in a CPS low. Looks like the faculty doesn't do that. When it gets to a CPS of one, some of the faculty come over. But once you get to a CPS of five, everybody comes over, either Pembro or Nevo. Any thoughts about this? A lot of debate about this over the last couple yeah, of years. Yeah, I think there's, there's been a lot of uh, splitting hairs on this. Uh, and, and on top of that, um, you know, there are different uh, assays that are used for theoretically for nivolumab and for pembrolizumab. And then, for instance, at our institution, we, we use our own in-house um, uh, testing. So I use a, a cut point of CPS5 for both nivolumab and pembrolizumab. I know some of my colleagues differentiate and, and use a higher cut point for pembrolizumab, but I think that the, probably the two are, are fairly similar. And I think that uh, uh, the pathologists have shown me over and over again that the difference between a CPS3 or 4 and a 6 and a 7 is very hard to adjudicate. Um, and I think that once you reach a certain threshold of PDL1 positivity, uh, you have that mechanism available, and that's when you should be using the immunotherapy unless there's contraindications. Uh, but uh, I think that, uh, in my opinion, the patients who are CPS negative, uh, the risks outweigh the benefits in, in the majority of the patients. I'm very careful uh, in, in that group of patients. In some patients, I'll inform them that it is FDA approved, but when I tell them uh, the, the data, uh, most educated patients will decide to, to hold off. Um, and this is really where uh, zolbituximab and bimarituzumab come in, uh, where these are agents that have been shown to uh, have additive benefit to Folfox um, and uh, are not dependent on CPS. Uh, and I think there's a niche for both of these agents uh, in these CPS low scoring uh, tumors. So to me, you said the key word is di discussing it with the patient and involving the patient in this difficult decision. So Zolbituximab, uh, final thoughts on, on, on that. It's before the FDA, uh, finally. Really interesting a mechanism of action, of course, focusing on Claudin 18.2. We'll talk more about that in the next uh, webinar. But we've seen uh, two trials. This is the GLOW study in uh, Claudin 18.2 positive patients. Uh, really interesting, not only PFS advantage, but survival advantage at this first report, which kind of surprised me. Uh, and then you have the uh, spotlight trial, sort of same uh, 
uh, basic approach. You know, same thing, survival and disease-free survival. Uh, as you point out, maybe you're going to be, here's the, the BEMA study, uh, trial you were talking about, but maybe, you know, randomized phase two, so not quite as far along. Uh, but uh, you brought up this issue of, would it, you know, would these other targeted therapies uh, not only be effective in general, but particularly in the CPS uh, low patients. Um, anything else that you want to say about zolbituximab in terms of efficacy in a, P, in a PD-1 patient uh, would you, who is also 18.2? Theoretically, would you want to give both? And any comments about the GI toxicity? I know that Claudin 18.2 is in the stomach, and so that kind of caught my attention. I hear hear a lot about nausea and vomiting. So your, your general thoughts about this really interesting agent. Yeah, I think just briefly, I would just say that zolbituximab has clearly shown activity in, in these cancers. Uh, and we have two very good studies uh, that demonstrate a survival benefit. Um, and I think that uh, the FDA should approve this agent. Um, the interesting point is that uh, Claudin 18.2 positivity doesn't correlate with CPS positivity or HER2 positivity. Uh, so there's clearly a subgroup of patients that are Claudin 18.2 high, HER2 negative, and CPS low. And I think that group of patients clearly uh, would benefit from the addition of zolbituximab to standard platinum and 5-FU therapy. Uh, your question about toxicity is, is valid. Um, if you don't know how to use the agent, you can end up with significant nausea and vomiting. What we've learned is that, uh, if you slow down the infusion rate, uh, you, uh, it, you can quickly, uh, make this a very tolerable treatment. And, uh, most of the nausea and vomiting occurs, uh, in the front, in the first cycle of therapy where patients are receiving the drug relatively quickly. And those patients who have problems, you slow it down, you give the NK inhibitors, uh, you can also give olanzapine, uh, and this really seems to take care of it, uh, for the most part. Uh, you're right that, uh, uh, patients with gastrectomy, uh, are a little bit different than the patients still with their stomach intact. Uh, uh, the other point to make is that zolbituximab also uh, seems to have significant activity in pancreas cancer uh, and that we're seeing a number of other uh, drugs coming down the pike that are now trying to utilize this Claudin 18.2 pathway. I think it's going to be a legitimate pathway, another option for our patients, uh, and will move the field forward uh, and improve uh, uh, quantity of life for our patients. So who knows? You know, you've heard of triple negative breast cancer. Maybe we'll talk about triple negative GE cancer in the next year or two. Here's how people are starting to think through the issue. Uh, so we say CPS of zero. Everybody says all the talks about, but interestingly, CPS of one, everybody also is still, and we push it up to 10 is where people, uh, start focusing more on checkpoint inhibitors as, you know, kind of makes sense, but. This is definitely an evolving story and very complicated one. And we're really looking forward to continuing to discuss this on our other two webinars. Peter, thank you so much uh, for working with us tonight. Audience, thank you for attending. Come on back next Tuesday. I'm really curious to see what our faculty has to say about checkpoint inhibitors and non-melanoma skin cancer and also uh, hedgehog inhibitors in a basal cell. Be safe, stay well, and have a great night. Thanks so much, Peter. Have a great night. Good night, and thank you for having me, Neil.